to analyze something, we must first define it. Sometimes defining a thing can be the most difficult of all. For example, how would you define love? Some people might define love as a hug. Or some people might define love as something much more intimate. On the other hand, others might define love as keeping your mouth shut when you don't have anything good to say. While others might define love as telling someone the hard truth, even if that truth hurts them for the rest of his life. We can define a chair as something you sit on. We can define an apple as sweet fruit that grows on a tree. But when we try to define love, we have a hug, a kiss, ignoring someone, or even hurting someone. That makes defining love very difficult. There are many words like love which are also difficult to define. For example, safety, democracy, home, friendship. And today, even the definitions of male and female are hard to trace and really define, as so many people have so many different definitions. To define something requires exploring the essential nature of a thing, not the component parts. For example, Many of these difficult ideas to define, such as patriotism, courage, and love, you cannot break them down into categories because they are so difficult to define. If I wanted to define a piano, this would be easy. I could identify the pedals, the keys, the strings, the hammers, the dampers, the housing, the lid. And if I wanted to be even more specific, I could talk about the bass bridge, the cast iron plate, the soundboard, the treble bridge, the tuning pins, and the tuning strings. I could further explore this even more in depth and talk about the hammer rail, the pressure bar, the pin block, the soft pedal, the muffler pedal, and the damper pedal. And by the time I finished, you might have a very good education on what a piano was, and you could easily define exactly what a piano was and what it wasn't. Now, do that with love. Okay, so let's look, look at a good example of how to define something in a piece of writing. William Kennedy's 1983 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Ironweed, opens with a definition that he adopted from the Audubon Society's Field Guide to North American Wildflowers. This is a great example of a definition that does what it means to do. Tall ironweed is a member of the sunflower family, or Asteraceae. It has a tall, erect stem and bears deep purple-blue flower heads in loose terminal clusters. Its leaves are long and thin and pointed their lower surfaces downy. Its fruit is seed-like, with a double set of purplish bristles. It flowers from August to October in damp, rich soil from New York, south to Georgia, west to Louisiana, north to Missouri, Illinois, and Michigan. The name refers to the toughness of the stem. Okay. Now, in Kennedy's story, a drunkard named Francis constantly travels around the United States from place to place without a home before he returns to his home. Many years ago, he left his home after he accidentally dropped and killed his own baby, and then in the heat of the moment, killed another man who was causing some problems in the town. The writer describes Francis as a man who constantly goes from place to place never quite staying there, trying to forget his past, and sometimes finds a place where he succeeds, but mostly he just continues his quest to discover himself. However, if you look up the definition of ironweed in the dictionary, the explanation is far less evocative and useful. 
It says, any plant of the genus Vernonia having clusters of purple flowers. And that's it. The way Kennedy defines ironweed in the story is much more helpful to understanding who Francis is and why he does what he does, because he is a metaphor for this strange blue sunflower. So there are two types of definitions. The first is known as the logical or formal definition. This definition has three components that must be included when trying to define something logically. Term, genus, and differentiate. The term is the thing that you are trying to define, also known as the species of the word. The genus limits that term to a specific class. Finally, the differentiate are the distinguishing distinguishing characteristics that show how that word is different from other words in the same species. So how does this work out? Here's an example. A helmet is a head covering worn for protection. The term is helmet. The genus is head covering. However, there are many kinds of head coverings. You can have hats, caps, bonnets, berets, scarves, bandanas, crowns, and so on. All of these things can be used to cover the head. However, most of the words I just mentioned are not worn for protection. Therefore, worn for protection is the differentiate. That's what sets the helmet apart from those other things like hats and caps. The differentiate is restrictive and sets that thing apart from other things that are similar. The logical or formal definition can define something that has a shape, weight, visual elements, or things that can be scientifically perceived. However, how do you define something that is esoteric or conceptual? Abstractions require a different method for definition. And that is where the second kind of definition is useful. The second kind of definition is the extended or informal definition. While both the logical definition and the extended definition use classification and differentiation, the extended or informal definition relies on implicit and not explicit explanations. Let's look at, look at an let's look at an example of an extended or informal definition. In Robert Ardrey's *The Territorial Imperative*, he tries to explain the concept of territory to his reader. A territory is an area of space, whether of water or earth or air, which an animal or a group of animals defends as an exclusive preserve. The word is also used to describe the inward compulsion in animate beings to possess and defend such a space. A territorial species of animals, therefore, is one in which all males, and sometimes females too, bear an inherent drive to gain and defend an exclusive property. In most but not all territorial species, Defense is directed against only fellow members of the kind. A squirrel does not regard a mouse as a trespasser. In most but not all territorial species, not in chameleons, for example, the female is sexually unresponsive to an unpropertied male. As a general pattern of behavior, in territorial species, the competition between males, which we formerly believed was one for the possession of females, is in truth for possession of property. When you try to define something difficult, uh, to define using an extended or informal definition, you rely on analysis of the thing you are trying to define as the definition itself. The reader will then infer implicitly from the definition what the meaning is, rather than being told explicitly, using sensory language, what that something is. 
So there are two approaches to definition you must decide on before you try to define something. The first approach is the deductive method. In a previous lecture, we explored deductive versus inductive methods. So let's explore this dialectic a little more. To define something using the deductive method, you first begin with the definition and then use specific examples to support or illustrate that definition. This method works very well with the star, this, the star writing method that we reviewed before um, in a previous lecture, where the examples in the paper are used to support the thesis. This is a deductive method of defining things. To define something using the inductive method, on the other hand, you can only reach the definition after you have examined something from many different angles. It is also important to not use the inductive method if you can use the deductive method, unless there is a very specific advantage to using the inductive method. For example, using inductive methods allows you to theoretically have many different variations of meaning. It allows you to focus on the process and not the solution as the primary study for the reader. If the thesis of your paper is to talk about the process of doing something, then when you define objects in that paper, it's better to use an inductive method than the deductive method. Here's an example of how to use an inductive method to define something quite nebulous and different. Here, William Shakespeare is going to try and define the idea of honor. Before I begin, as the language here may be a little difficult, Remember that he is using the inductive method because the process of understanding honor he views as more important than the definition itself. As you are listening, think about how the process is important to him and how that process is important to the definition of honor. Honor pricks me on, or honor spurs my actions. Yea, but if honor prick me off when I come on, or what if honor places me on the list of casualties? How then? Can honor set a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then? No. What is honor? A word. What is it that word honor? What is in that word honor? What is that word honor? Air, a trim reckoning. Who hath it? He that died on Wednesday. Doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then? Yeah, to the dead. But will it not live with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Therefore, I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon, and so ends my catechism. For Shakespeare, he is saying that the process of acquiring or losing honor is actually more important than the meaning of it. He does try to provide a meaning, but in his trying to provide a meaning, he is actually revealing something far more important, that the definition of honor is as important as the acquisition of it. So how do you figure out what to define in your writing? The first thing you need to do when using definition in your writing is to have a topic you want to define. What topic out of the thousands of different topics will you choose? And once you have chosen a topic to write about, what word related to that topic will you choose to define? Obviously, you should choose a topic that interests you, a topic that you want to know more about, and specifically a topic you want defined because either you don't know what that topic or word means, or you desperately want to know more than what you already know about that word. You also need to consider the purpose of why you are trying to define that word. 
most people don't want to read an article or paper that is just about the definition of something. The definition must be connected or tied with something else. For example, how has love been viewed over many years? How has the definition of love changed over time? And how does that definition find meaning in literature, plays, and poetry? Or you could write about the different kinds of love today. What are the differences between platonic love, passionate love, Christian love, familial love, and national love? Consider your audience carefully. Whenever you write, you need to consider who you are writing for and how to hold the attention of your audience. Maybe your audience is highly educated, and they would like difficult dictionary-level definitions with philosophical underpinnings. Or maybe they are just looking for stories of people in love with each other and what that looks like. Or perhaps they would like stories of how people love in other cultures, and you have the opportunity to introduce the rights, rituals, and traditions of far-off countries to people in your own country. But how do you apply definition in your writing? There are various rhetorical strategies you can use in order to best use the skill of definition. You can investigate an idea by describing your mother's suffering when she was a young woman and living away from her own parents, lonely and scared and how that reminded her of the love of her own parents, and how that idea of love has passed from your mother to you over time. You could narrate a definition of first love by talking about your own experience when you first fell in love with someone, what was happening to you at the time, where you were, what you were doing, and how all that led to your own understanding of what love was or wasn't. You could explain the process of how love actually alters someone's brain, the chemicals that are released into the body, and the scientific process of how love becomes a holistic bodily response. You could then show how the changes in the body result in physical alterations and end up feeding back into the brain to produce heightened emotions. You could compare or contrast different perceptions of love between different people or different generations, showing how love has changed over time or changes between regions. You could make an argument for a particular kind of love as being necessary for the betterment of a future society. You could attempt to persuade people to change their minds about the current perceptions of love. You could classify the different types of love. You could historically trace the etymology of love across time and space, show the significance of the meaning of the word and how the linguistic use of love has changed our perceptions and philosophical outlook on life. Or you could do any of the strategies I mentioned with any other word you could imagine. The possibilities are endless. The use of definitions is endless in writing.